Hello, everyone, and welcome to Microbiology. Remember that I'm your professor, Kelly Roberts. Um, feel free to call me Kelly or Professor Roberts. Um, I am going to be your professor for this semester, and remember that we are engaging in a flipped model classroom. So what that means is that you will be viewing your lectures online at your leisure all throughout the semester, and we'll work on assignments and worksheets and various different activities to help make sure that you fully grasp the concept that we are um, engaging in and that we're going to be discussing. So for today's topic, we're going to start with chapter one, the microbial world and you. We're going to talk about what microbes are, how they are found in our lives. We're going to talk about um, how we classify microbes, designer names, um, the, the names that we call um, microbes. Um, so there's several different topics that we're going to cover. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So microorganisms is just a fancy way of kind of saying bacteria. Microorganisms means that it's any living thing that's too small to be seen by the naked eye. Micro means small, and an organism is obviously a living thing. Now, sometimes we use the term germs to refer to a microorganism, but that can be a little bit misleading. Um, germs, sometimes we attribute that to anything that's pathogenic or causes disease, when really what we mean in a scientific way is that a germ, any cell that grows very rapidly. And prokaryotic cells, which microorganisms or prokaryotic cells are an example of microorganisms, are rapidly growing cells. Some of these germs, quote unquote, if you will, are what we consider to be pathogenic. Now that term in bold, pathogenic, is going to be something that we are going to be um, using a term that we're going to use all throughout the semester because it means it causes a disease, especially in that second half after spring break. There are some microbes that, in fact, are pathogenic. We have some microbes that are actually beneficial to us because they can decompose organic waste. We have some microorganisms that can produce oxygen or other um, molecules that are needed by the environment. Um, some that are producers in the ecosystem by photosynthesis, and we'll talk about those at length in the upcoming chapters. Um, some can produce industrial chemicals such as ethanol and acetone. Um, citric acid is one is also one that we use as a preservative um, in many different things. Some of their byproducts of fermentation we can use as preservatives or additives of foods or to fuel our cars or to make us drunk. So there are quite a few um, uses for those byproducts. Um, as I said before, we have fermented foods, vinegar, cheese, bread, and there are microorganisms that can be used in manufacturing, such as cellulase. Um, cellulase is used um, as manufacturing to make kind of that stonewashed denim or the whiskers sort of in your jeans that you find that were really, really popular a few years ago. I'm not sure if they're as popular now. And then we also have um, a way that we've been able to use um, genetic recombination to have microorganisms make things like insulin for us. So there are microbes that and are part of our everyday lives. Some of these uses are beneficial and others not so much. So designer genes made by microorganisms. So the stone washing technique of kind of softening up the denim. Um, denim hat is notorious for being a very sturdy, rugged material, um, the very rugged cotton material. However, it can be so rugged and so stiff that it can be uncomfortable. So the idea of stone washing denim, um, you could actually beat them across stones, hence the name stone washing, to soften up the denim so they're not as stiff and they're much more comfortable to wear. But we also found that by using a microorganism that has cellulase, um, trichoderma is the name of the, the genus of the microorganism, that we've been able to get the same effect without having to use as much um, abrasive, such, such abrasive, abrasive techniques. So to soften up the denim, the microorganism uses its cellulase enzyme to break down some of those cellulose fibers of the cotton to make it a little bit softer, more pliable product, a more easily wearable product. Um, we kind of can, we can make cotton or the byproducts of cotton um, using different kinds of glucoacinobacter um, bacteria can do that. We have um, de-bleaching that can be done on um, denim by uh, mushroom peroxidase. Um, so um, the mushroom peroxidase can lighten the color of jeans. And if you've ever worked at the Gap or Abercrombie & Fitch or Hollister 
or the buckle or any of those patient uh, places, then you're probably very familiar with the various different types. Even if you haven't worked there, if you shop there, you're probably very familiar with the various different types of shades and colorations of the denim, um, and that all can be done with microorganisms by using different, various levels of peroxidase to get that color. Um, to get the indigo color, we can use the E. coli microorganism for that, and even to make some plastics or derivatives of plastic, parts of the polymer that make up plastic, we have some bacteria that are able to do that as well. So we've been able to exploit some of these really cool attributes, whether it's the enzymes that they make or the byproducts that they leave behind, to use in the fashion industry um, and also to use in um, the manufacturing industry as well. So by having a knowledge of microorganisms, we were able to do two really important things. The first really important thing that we were able to do with our knowledge of the fact that A, microbes exist, and B, that there are certain attributes um, about microbes that we can either prevent or um, that we know that we can't prevent, so we will avoid, and that's the preventing the spoilage of food is one of the um, biggest accomplishments of an understanding of microbiology and also the prevention of disease occurrence. So it was once believed long, long ago that if you were to get sick um, or if you were to die as a result of what we would consider some disease, it was because you were evil or you were poor or God didn't like you or you did something to angry God or the gods. And we soon found out that really it had nothing to do with how God felt about you personally or it had nothing to do with your economic status. It was more like the result, it was actually the result of a microbial disease, um, and that microbes are actually responsible for causing diseases. So since we finally had an understanding of why people get sick and why food spoils, it's not because you have evil spirits in your house and that's why your grapes went bad, um, now that we have an understanding of this, then it led to what we call aseptic techniques. So this term aseptic techniques is something that we're going to use routinely in our laboratory studies and also we'll talk about routinely in our discussion here um, on Blackboard collaborating in our lectures. So what aseptic means, a will always mean not of, so if you are asocial, you are not a social person. Um, aseptic techniques, septic means to contaminate or um, to be um, um, lots of uh, microbes that are there. So aseptic techniques means, means that we're using techniques and we're using tools that are preventing the contamination with microorganisms. So the understanding that microbes spoil food and microbes cause diseases, that allows us to develop these aseptic techniques or these more sterile techniques in both medicine and in microbiology laboratories as well as in food preparation, especially in a commercial sense. So now we're going to go on to how we name and classify microorganisms. Oops, excuse me. Um, Carlos Linnaeus, which you're probably very familiar with, and you've taken an introductory biology course or a high school biology course, established this binomial nomenclature of naming organisms. And you may have learned it as you have the genus and the species for that binomial nomenclature. So for humans, our scientific name would be Homo sapiens. Um, so each organism has two names to it. We're going to call those two names instead of the genus and the species. We're going to call it in microbiology the genus and a specific epitaph. So one of the names of the organisms that we will be working with quite routinely is called Escheria coli, also known as E. coli. So Escheria is the genus name, and coli is going to be the specific ep specific epitaph. Whenever we have scientific names for microorganisms, as you read them throughout your text, as we discuss them in lab and you read them in your lab book, um, they are italicized or underlined. The genus name, so if we're talking about Escheria coli, the first time that we talk about this microorganism in the text, Escheria with the E will be capitalized, and then the specific epitaph of coli is going to be the C will be in lowercase. We have Latinized the scientific names so that they can be used worldwide. So whether you're speaking in Italian or French or English or Portuguese, whatever it may be, the scientific name will always remain the same. Now, when we come to naming microorganisms, we can name them in a couple of different ways. Sometimes we can name them very descriptive, as in the case of Staphylococcus aureus, which is going to denote not only the shape and the configuration of the microorganism, um, and then it talks about how there's an aura around it. So that aureus is the aura around it. 
or we have microorganisms that have been named to honor a scientist. Um, or we name microorganisms as to where they can commonly be found. A good example of that would be Escheria coli. Thomas Erhlich was the scientist who discovered Escheria coli, and he found that it prim primarily remains or is found in the gut of, um, or in the colon of, of humans and other animals. So that's how it gets the coli specific epitaph because it's commonly found and it's okay for E. coli to be found in your colon and since he discovered it, he gets to call it Escheria um, after his name, uh, Thomas Erslick. So a good example of a descriptive microorganism, Staphylococcus aureus, it describes not only the shape, which are going to be cocci or round circles, little balls, but it also describes the configuration in which these cells are found. And that would be staphylo. Staphylo means clusters. So Staphylococcus aureus are clusters of these spherical balls together. And when we look at them under the microscope, they actually look like, and after we grand stain them, um, they look like bunches of grapes. They literally look like bunches of grapes. Very, very beautiful picture. Now the aureus part, we're not going to really see that um, because we only see the aureus if you have not stained the cells and we have stained, we will have stained all of our cells um, using the gram staining method when we look at them. It means that they have this kind of golden colored color colonies or this aura around them. So when we're using scientific names, you've kind of heard me routinely say E. coli and shorten it for Escheria coli, or you'll hear me say Staph aureus, or you'll see it written down just as E. period coli or S. period aureus. After the first time that we've introduced this particular scientific name and we've used a full Latinized binomial nomenclature version of it, then we can abbreviate it by just using a capital letter for the genus, in the case of E. coli, capital letter for the E, period, and then use the specific epitaph coli um, in lowercase for a lowercase c. So for example, we have Escheria coli and Staphylococcus aureus are found in the human body, in or on the human body. Um, e. coli is found in the large intestine, and Staph aureus is found, or S. aureus is found on the skin. So that's just a good example of how we would use that. Many times in your textbook, for the first couple of chapters that we go over, um, it will say the name of the organism with the full genus, full specific epitaph name, but then in subsequent chapters you're going to find it where it's just written in the abbreviated form. So if we were trying to, if this is a question on your exam, and it says which of these are correct scientific names, which of these would follow? A, Baker's yeast, B, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, C, Saccharomyces cerevisiae italicized, or D, S. cerveceus. And if you're thinking letter C, Saccharomyces cerveceus italicized, you're absolutely correct. Although B and C are both spelled exactly the same, the only difference between the two is what? Being italicized. And remember, for any of these scientific names, we're going to either italicize them, or what's the other way that we can denote that this is a scientific name? Absolutely right. We can underline it. Baker's yeast is a common name for Saccharomyces cerevisiae. We want it to be scientific name for that. And then S. cerevisiae, although that is correct as well, that's only for when we've actually seen the name given in the text before, um, we would be able to use that abbreviation. So there are various different types of microorganisms. So far, Staph aureus and E. coli are only two types of prokaryotic cells, and they both happen to be types of bacteria. Bacteria are not the only microorganisms out there, ladies and gentlemen. There is a whole world of microorganisms, and that's why we have a whole class that's just devoted to the study of microorganisms. So bacteria, as we've already discussed, are obviously too small to be seen by the naked eye. They would fit in the classification of microorganisms. Those organisms that are in the domain of archaea, archaea are going to be organisms that are prokaryotic cells, which means they don't have a nucleus like bacteria, but they're slightly different. They don't have a cell wall, and they have some other little nuances um, that give them their own domain, but they're also still considered microorganisms. Fungi, protozoa, algae, viruses, keep in mind um, that not all algae is considered microscopic, but there are some microscopic algae that we'll talk about. Viruses, multicellular animal parasites, once again, 
For multicellular parasites, we're going to talk about mostly the larval stage of these parasites and not so much the um, adult form of them, although there are some, like Schistomyces, um, that are going to be even in their adult form, they're still microorganisms. So there's a whole list, and all of these different microorganisms that are found on this list, we're going to talk about in some aspect or another throughout the semester. So here's just a pretty picture of a kind of representative example of bacteria. So these would not be considered cocci because they are rod-shaped. So this would be bacillus. We have some fungi here and the sporangia of those fungi. Those would bud off and then take residence somewhere else and grow their own colonies. We have these protozoa. Um, here it looks like we have an amoebic type organism that is getting ready to use its pseudopods to engulf its prey. We have some algae here. Um, gliocapsa is what this looks to be to me. We have this algae that we have. And then we have the big green thing is a T cell, so that's a eukaryotic cell. And then all of these little red dots are the HIV virus that are trying to make their way inside of that T cell. So first on our list, we're going to have a very brief discussion of what are bacteria. So everything that we saw on our list, we're going to have a very brief discussion in Chapter 1 about what each of these organisms are and what are some of the major hallmarks. Keep in mind that we will have full in-depth chapters on most, if not all, of those items that were on the list of microorganisms. So to start off, we're going to talk about bacteria. In lab class, we're going to spend a majority of our time working with and discussing bacteria. We will have labs on fungi, we will have labs on viruses, but for the most part, we're going to be working with bacteria. Key features of all bacteria is that they are all prokaryotic. Prokaryotic means that they do not have a nucleus or other membrane-bound organelles, and they um, are also quite small and quite simple in comparison to the cells that make up your body, which are considered eukaryotic. Bacteria also have a cell wall. The composition or what makes up that cell wall is a combination of proteins and sugar, which we call peptidoglycan. We will talk about peptidoglycan at length this semester, especially when we get to chapter four. The way that they will reproduce is through binary fission, which is a type of asexual reproduction. So bacteria don't need another bacteria to make copies of themselves. They can make copies of themselves simply through binary fission. For energy, they can use organic chemicals much the same way that you use organic chemicals. So they can use carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, um, things of that nature, um, and much the same way that you use carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, etc. Or they can use inorganic chemicals like sulfur. They can get um, energy from sulfur. Or, like plants, they can use sunlight to make their food. So their energy needs are a little different from your run-of-the-mill eukaryotic cell. Because for eukaryotic cells, we can only, most of us, can only use either organic chemicals or photosynthesis if you're a plant. Um, but for microorganisms, they are such a vast, or bacteria, they are such a vast group of cells that they can sometimes use inorganic chemicals. And we can exploit the fact that they can use inorganic chemicals to help us decompose waste and also to clean up things like oil spills in a process known as bioremediation. And we'll hit on that a little bit later as well. So what we have here um, is a bacteria, a rod-shaped bacterium, and if you'll remember, if it's a rod, it's called a bacillus. Haemophilus influenzae, which is one of the bacterial causes of, of pneumonia, and we'll talk about um, that a little bit more when we get uh, after spring break. Archaea are also prokaryotic cells in much the same way that bacteria are prokaryotic cells, but archaea have their own domain. They have the similarity in the fact that they're prokaryotic cells, small, no membrane-bound nucleus, no membrane-bound organelles like we saw for bacteria, those things are the same. But archaea are actually more closely similar to eukaryotic cells. And we'll talk about that evolution and that lineage a little bit later on in this chapter. Unlike bacteria who have a peptidoglycan cell wall, that combination of proteins and sugars, archaea don't have peptidoglycan for their cell wall. In fact, most archaea are what we consider wallless. They don't have a cell wall at all. 
Arcadia lived in very extreme environments, places where most living cells would be unable to live. So they can live in places where there's a high concentration of methogen gas, and we call them methogenate methogens. Um, they can live in places with a very high salt content, such as the Dead Sea, and we call those extreme halophiles. Or they can live in places like around vents um, at the bottom of the ocean that get really warm around um, volcanic ash or even in hot springs, and we call those extreme thermophiles. So Arcadia, they can live, we, we call them kind of generally extremophiles. They really love or like these really extremes in temperatures or pH or um, gas concentrations or in salt concentrations. We won't have the opportunity in this introductory microbiology class to work with any Arcadia, but we'll definitely be talking about them. Fungi, our next class of microorganisms here, are the first class so far of eukaryotic cells. So far on our list, we've talked about bacteria and we've talked about Arcadia. Both of those are considered prokaryotic cells. Fungi are the first of only two on our list that are composed of eukaryotic cells. Like bacteria, fungi also have cell walls. However, the chemical composition of the cell walls of fungi is made out of chitin. Chitin is a polysaccharide that is very similar to um, cellulose, or very similar to starch, but it's kind of shaped a little bit differently. So the molecular structure of it is just a little bit different, and we call it chitin. Um, what fungi must use to meet their, uh, their energetic demands are organic chemicals, so much the same way that you need proteins, lipids, carbohydrates to meet your energetic needs, so do fungi. Um, molds and mushrooms are examples of multicellular fungi that have masses of mycelia, which are composed of filaments called hyphae. And those filaments can break off, and we can have those um, hyphae that will colonize different places, and it can spread. Yeast, on the other hand, are unicellular. And in one of our first upcoming labs here, we're going to look at um, some yeast under the microscope, and we're also going to culture some yeast from between your toes. So here we have mucor, which is a common bread mold and a very common type of fungus. You all are very familiar with this, um, that kind of blue-greenish kind of color to it. You have these hyphae, and then you have the sporangium, which can break off and then colonize other pieces of bread. These hyphae can grow and, and, and spread and branch out so that the mold can grow on that one piece of bread that it's already on. So the second of our list of the two eukaryotic cells we'll talk about are protozoans. Protozoans, like fungi, are eukaryotic. However, unlike fungi, protozoa do not have cell walls. So remember, fungi have the cell walls that were made of chitin. Archaea were wallless. They did not have a cell wall. They did not have the peptidyl glycan. But bacteria have the cell wall made out of peptidyl glycan. So what a good idea would be to do is that in your notes, in your personal notes that you make, is to kind of form a list and do some compare and contrast between these different types of microorganisms, specifically noting who has a cell wall, who doesn't, who's prokaryotic, who's not prokaryotic, who needs to use organic chemicals, who can use inorganic chemicals, and things like that to sort of keep these microorganisms organized. So like fungi, um, protozoa has to absorb or ingest organic uh, chemicals. We say absorb because, like, the um, amoeba will kind of absorb its prey item into it through endocytosis. Um, they can be motile, so they can move. Fungi and molds don't really move. They're usually carried by the environment from one place to the next. Um, but they can move either through pseudopods, cilia, or flagella. Bacteria can also move, but the only way that they would be able to move is through, have, through the use of a flagella. And here we have an amoeba, which is a protozoa that is attempting to absorb its food particle, its prey item there. And on to algae. Um, Algae, I'm sorry, I forgot we had algae on our list. is our third type of eukaryotic cell. Um, algae, like fungi, have cell walls, but unlike fungi, the cell walls of algae are made out of cellulose. Remember fungi, the cell walls are made out of what's the other C word? Chitin. Algae are typically green, um, and usually you found that things that are green can undergo photosynthesis. So the way that algae are able to meet its energetic demands or to meet its food demands um, is to use photosynthesis for energy. 
Um, they will make, as a byproduct of their photosynthesis, molecular oxygen that can be used in the atmosphere and other types of organic compounds that it can either be used by the algae or can be used by other organisms in the ecosystem. So, so far, we've had three organisms on our list of five um, that had a cell wall. We had bacteria that had a cell wall that was um, made out of peptidoglycan. We had the fungi that had a cell wall that was made out of chitin. We've had algae that has a cell wall that's made out of cellulose. Remember, archaea and the protozoan were the two of the five that we've discussed so far that do not have a cell wall. And here is some bulbox, and I called it geocapta. Um, there's some bulbox as an example of um, pond algae. On to viruses. Now, viruses are the only microorganism on our list that are considered to be acellular, which means they are not made out of cells. Everything else we've talked about so far has either been a eukaryotic or a prokaryotic cell. Because viruses are acellular, and because viruses have either DNA or RNA, so they have some sort of genetic message, some scientists are still on the fence as to whether or not to consider viruses living or not living. Viruses can only replicate if they're inside a living host cell. So for that reason, and the fact that we said that all living things are made out of the basic unit of life, which is called the cell, there are some scientists that would disagree to say that viruses are living. However, because viruses have genetic material, which is one of the hallmarks of life. And even though they can only replicate inside a host cell, they do replicate. There's a whole other camp of scientists that will argue to say that viruses are living. So um, I wouldn't ask you that question. I might ask it to you as a short answer question to give me um, evidence or discuss why viruses are, why are we not quite sure viruses are living or not living. Um, but really, to be honest, we're still kind of not at a full general consensus within the scientific community. So the core of the virus, where the DNA or the RNA is found, is surrounded by a protein coat. And sometimes that protein coat can be enclosed with an envelope, and we call that uh, an enveloped virus, and a non-enveloped virus if that protein coat was not there. Example of viruses that you're probably very familiar with is the HIV virus, um, which we have shown here. On to multicellular animal parasites, another eukaryotic cell here. So we have fungi, protozoan, and now we have an algae, and now we have um, animal parasites on here. They are actual multicellular animals. Helminths are a very good example of that. So parasitic flatworms and roundworms, such as hookworm, um, uh, tapeworm. So tapeworm is a flatworm. Hookworm is a roundworm. Those are considered helminths, and those are parasitic animals. Most of the aspects of that organism that we would consider to be microscopic are the stages in its life cycle. So some of the larval and the egg stages are microscopic, and that's how we kind of group them in. And, they, and some of them are, can be very small, like pinworm. You can't see the naked eye, but you have a better picture of it if you see it underneath the microscope. So some of those helminths. Um, they're all considered those parasitic animal parasites. And we'll talk this about schistosomyces and um, various different types of um, worm or parasitic infections. Um, and here we have a parasitic um, guinea worm that's being pulled out of the heel of a patient here. Um, it is believed that the removal of this parasitic um, worm, this guinea worm, um, and the way they would pull it out is it would wind it around a rod. It is kind of why we have the rod of a cephalus, which is the symbol for the, the medical profession on there. So they wind it onto this rod or this stick, and they pull it out. So that's a very important, um, or this procedure is probably a very important um, role in the diagnostic, of, uh, the diagnostic use of this infection. And as you can see, we can definitely see the worm. It's not like it's invisible to the naked eye like a bacteria would be. Um, but the larval stages of it and how it's able to get into wounds so easily um, is attributed to the different life cycle stages that are microscopic. So how we classify all of those microorganisms that we just talked about, the parasitic worm, the algae, the, um, the protozoan, the archaea, the bacteria, how we classify all of these is and we can boil them all down, no matter how vast and different they are, into one of three domains, either bacteria, archaea, or eukarya. 
Eukarya is the largest of those three domains. It includes produce, fungi, and even us, animals, as well as plants like the grass and the tree outside. Of the four of these different types of organisms that fit into domain Archaea, we're going to primarily focus on microscopic parasitic animals, um, produce, and fungi. Most of our discussion this semester will be on bacteria. But we'll talk a little bit about Archaea, those extremophiles, but not a whole lot. So Archaea and Eukarya have their very own domain, although Archaea is similar in many ways, the fact that it's prokaryotic, to bacteria. So if we were to look at this three domain system and what we have in front of you is what we call a phylogenetic tree. So this phylogenetic tree is a way that scientists, it helps us to recognize who is more closely related to whom and how organisms fit into, if you will, this tree of life. So what we have here is that any time you here see a, a point where there is divergence that take, that's taking place, that's looking at how the lineage is breaking off. So there was a, a hypothetical common ancestor at some point. So there's some horizontal gene transfer that occurred with an early community of cells that gave us these two very different camps of eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells of bacteria. At another point later on, there is still more horizontal gene transfer, and that just means there's genetic shift and there are things that are taking place evolutionarily that has changed the composition and the um, requirements and just the genetic makeup of these cells that Archaea eventually branched off and became its own domain. So if we were to look at this tree, um, and another point I want to make is the further apart two branches are, the less they have in common. The closer two branches are, the more they have in common. They have a hypothetical common ancestor that was found closer to um, um, in, the, in the, the, the lineage of time than maybe two other organisms have. So if we look at this tree, it would appear to us that Archaea and Eukarya are more closely related to one another, these branches are closer together, than Archaea is to um, bacteria, although they're both prokaryotic cells, it seems to fit from our understanding of DNA and RNA analysis um, and various other um, tools that we use to help develop these phylogenetic trees that Archaea and Eukarya are more closely related to one another. So a little bit of the brief history of microbiology. So now that we have an understanding of what microbes are, who are the key players in microbes? How are they related to one another? What domains do they fit in? How do we name them and classify microorganisms? Let's talk about how we got to this discipline of microorganisms or microbiology. Now, microorganisms are believed to have been the first life form here on Earth. So they were here, it's believed, and it's hypothesized. They were here on Earth long before humans were. However, we didn't first develop an understanding or start to even see them um, until about 1673. So if you look at it on an evolutionary scale and you look at how long they've been here, it's only been a relatively short amount of time that we have acknowledged their existence, at least in the scientific community, the written scientific community. So some first observations. In 1665, Robert Hoke reported that living things are composed of little tiny boxes, what he coined the, word, the phrase cell. Those little tiny boxes, he saw boxes because he was looking at a wine cork, and wine cork is traditionally made up from the bark of trees, um, and trees are um, a type of eukaryotic cell that their cells, they have cell walls around them made out of cellulose. So what he was actually looking at was something that probably looked a lot like this. And then we'll throw a nucleus in there somewhere. So what he saw, or what he reported, were these little teeny tiny cells in there. So that's why he coined the term cells, because that's what they look like. They look like little prison cells, or they look like little cells or little boxes. In 1858, Rudolf Virchow said that cells arise from pre-existing cells. He was one of the first scientists to say that a cell must come from a pre-existing cell. Um, their idea of the cell theory comes from what Virchow said. And the cell theory is something that we still use and we still embrace today, that all living things are composed of cells and come from pre-existing cells. 
Now, remember that discussion we had on viruses and why we're not sure if they're living or not living simply because um, they're acellular and there are some people that say, well, that completely goes against the cell theory, and there's your discussion for that. But the cell theory tells us, and it states, that all living things are composed of cells and they come from pre-existing cells. And we have Rickshaw to thank for um, bringing us to that, that conclusion or starting that conversation. So the first observations of microorganisms happened between 1573 and 1723. Anton von Ludwig is credited with inventing the microscope, um, and he would throw these really fancy viewing parties where he'd look at his teeth scrapings, he'd look at um, some of his guests would volunteer some of their fecal matter to be looked at on this microscope. They looked inside their teeth, and there's one woman who was reported to saying, he writes in his diary, that when she looked into her teeth with the microscope, now, keep in mind, this is in the 1600s, well before water filtration. She said, egad, there is a zoo in my tea, because she could see that it was teeming with life and teeming with these microorganisms. Um, von Leeuwenhoek's microscope, although very um, archaic, is not all that different from what we use in our microscopes today. A lot of the features and hallmarks of it are very much the same. We have a lens. And through that lens, we view our specimen. Right now, we have a compound set of lens. We have usually two of them as the eye pieces. And then we have another set of lenses as our objective. But there is still a lens system there. We have a stage, or what we, the, what Van Leeuwenhoek used was the tip of a pen. Um, he used that area um, to place his specimen. And then he could move his specimen. Um, he could position it either left or right, bring it closer to the lens or further away from it, in much the same way that we can use our coarse adjustment knobs and our fine adjustment knobs to move the stage closer to the objectives or further away from the objective. Um, we can move it to the left and the right, so we can use the stage positioning screw, what he used the stage positioning screw, um, to, to actually move and um, rearrange the, the placement of the specimen. So a lot of the the, the schematics of his early microscope are not all that different from what we use today for our microscopes. Now, with all of this information, the fact that we can see microorganisms, and Birchall says that life must come from pre-existing life, that kind of developed a debate. Because keep in mind, prior to all of this, we thought that life arose from what we considered vital forces. So spontaneous generation is this hypothesis that we now know to be an erroneous hypothesis, that living organisms come from non-living matter, or these vital forces. Whereas biogenesis, which kind of set up the framework for the cell theory, is that it's a hypothesis that living organisms arise from pre-existing life. So cells beget cells. Cells come from cells. So let's look at the evidence of this and, and see how they may have worked through this um, in the 16th and the 1700s, in the 16th and, uh, 15th and the 16th century. So in 1668, Francisco Reddy filled six jars of decaying meat. Um, it was believed at that time that maggots came from vital forces in the air. She left a piece of meat out, and because it was decaying, then the vital forces would come, and they would spring life into that meat, and, or the spirits would come and bring life to that meat, and that's why flies came out of it. So Francisco Reddy, he didn't quite agree with that. So he said, let's just set up an experiment to see what happens. So his conditions were he had three jars that were covered with a fine net and three jars that were left open. And the three jars that were covered with a fine net, no life came from them. It just became meat. And the three open jars, maggots appeared. Where did the maggots come from? You got it. The flies laid the eggs on the maggots, and the eggs then um, hatched and became maggots. Why did he steal those jars? He needed, it, needed them as a control. He went to see if he sealed off those barriers and nothing can land on them, nothing can come to them. And who has time to sit and watch people decaying meat for 24 hours for days and days on end? Not going to happen. So you, since he couldn't watch it and they had no video camera to actually record when the flies actually landed on um, the meat, he sealed the jars instead. So from his work, did Francisco Reedy's um, experimentation support biogenesis or spontaneous generation? It was support for, uh, for biogenesis. Cells come from other cells. Life begets life. 
Then we have in 1745, John Needham, um, he took it a little bit different level. At this point, we're not only seeing, so back in Francisco already, um, that was like 1665, um, we didn't really have a, a well-developed understanding of microorganisms. So now by this point in time, we have the microscope by Van Leeuwenhoek, and we have a better understanding that microorganisms, and we have accepted that they do exist. So Needham put boiled nutrient broth into covered glass. His conditions were the nutrient broth was heated, then placed in a sealed flask. What he observed was that there was microbial growth. So before we go on to the first question, let's answer the second question. He heated the broth and he placed it in the flask and we still got microbial growth. Does his work support spontaneous generation or biogenesis? Let's not talk about the flaws in his experiment yet. Let's just talk about his work. Does it support spontaneous generation or biogenesis? It supports spontaneous generation, absolutely. Um, where did those microbes come from? because they were placed in a sealed glass, right? And the nutrient broth was heated. Do we know exactly how clean that flask was? Nope, we don't know how clean that flask was. So those microorganisms were already present in the flask because it was not cleaned out. We took heated broth and then we transferred it, which means the microbes that were in the air probably got into the broth and we transferred it over. And then there are microbes that were in the flask as well. So sealing it after the fact didn't really do much for it. So although he has evidence that supports spontaneous generation, um, some of the elements of his, his experimental design were flawed. So about 20 years later, um, Lazaro Spalzanini boiled nutrient solutions and put them in flasks as well. Nutrient broth, placed in flask, heated, and then sealed. So instead of transferring it from one flask to another, he heated it in the same flask and sealed that same flask. No microbial growth. Does this support spontaneous generation or biogenesis? Absolutely. It supports biogenesis. Because at this point here, we have killed the microorganisms that were in the flask, that were in the nutrient broth that may have gotten in there from the air, and then we sealed it off so nothing else could get into it. By the time Louis Pasteur came around, he was able to not only demonstrate that microorganisms cause the spoilage of food, which is a very important contribution he made to microbiology, because, you know, really, Louis Pasteur wanted to figure out how we could get our wine from one part of the, the, the continent or one part of the, the world or the country to another part without it spoiling. So he recognized that microorganisms are responsible for causing the spoilage of food. Um, he was also one of the, 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 the premier scientists to discuss and acknowledge that microorganisms cause disease, but he also was able to have work that proved that microorganisms um, are present in the air and how we can combat or how we can um, prevent the presence of these microorganisms in the air from contaminating our food or, and more importantly, from contaminating our wine. So the conditions that he used to prove that microorganisms are in the air is that he had nutrient broth placed in a flask, heated, not sealed, um, kind of like what we saw with Spalzini had, except he didn't seal this flask. And then obviously there was microbial growth, obvious for us now, not so obvious then. And then he took another uh, flask with the nutrient broth in the flask, heated and then sealed it, and no microbial growth. So for Pasteur's work, which does this support? Spontaneous generation or biogenesis? Biogenesis, absolutely right. So Pasteur, developed this S-shaped flask to keep microbes out, but to let, my, to let air in. At this point, with the work of Louis Pasteur and the work of some other very notable scientists, um, we were able to establish that biogenesis should be the law of the land, if you will, that microorganisms or cells come from other living cells. So with Pasteur's S-shaped flask, he was able to allow air to get in, but the microorganisms could not, which is a very key feature in his process, or the early um, use of this process known as pasteurization. And that idea of pasteurization is what allowed for them to, or us, to ship wine, or today, to ship milk and cheese and orange juice and various other things from one part of the world to the other without having to worry about it spoiling.
So here's a picture of um, Pasteur's S-shaped flask. So first it was poured the broth into the long neck flask, and in that broth there were microorganisms that were present. Um, next he heated the neck of the flask and bent it into this S-shape, and then boiled the nutrient broth for several minutes. So the air was able to escape out, but microorganisms, so the microorganisms would be killed by the teeth, but the um, the air was able to escape out so your flask did not burst. You couldn't just seal it off and then um, boil it because there's a chance that you would um, evaporate everything out or your flask would break. So the microorganisms were not present after the boiling. Um, microorganisms did not appear in the cool solution, and this is where the um, genius of the S-shaped flask comes in there. It's called S-shaped because it's like an S on its side. You kind of see that S in there on its side because microorganisms would be trapped in the bends of the flask. So you got to keep in mind that the diameter of this flask is very, very skinny. If you would pull it out, if you've ever blown glass or pulled glass, you can make very, very small filaments. So it's this very, very thin. So you pull it out very, very thin so that the microorganisms would be trapped on the bends of the glass and the surface tension was so high in those bends that those microorganisms would not be able to escape and get into the cool solution. With the work of Louis Pasteur, this is what's considered the golden age of microbiology from about 1857 to 1914, where we had a lot of really groundbreaking discoveries in the relationship between microbes and humans and disease and food, the development of antimicrobial drugs, and also an understanding of immunity. So we call this our golden age of microbiology. Pasteur's work, um, as I said before, led to this understanding of pasteurization and what we call fermentation. Um, Pasteur was able to show that microbes are responsible for fermentation, and the way that he used the term fermentation was as, as spoiling. Um, fermentation is a chemical process by which sugars are converted to alcohol, which we can use for beer and wine, but the further the more fermentation you have take place and the more microbial growth that is present, it can also allow for the spoilage of food. So your beer and your wine can go bad because you have too many of the overgrowth of microorganisms and instead of it being wine tasting, it's acetic acid and it tastes like vinegar because that's what acetic acid is. So bacteria can, that use alcohol produce acetic acid and spoil the wine by turning it into vinegar. Um, because they're making this byproduct of acetic acid as they consume um, the wine or they consume the sugar in the wine or the, um, the barley and the malt in the beer, it causes it to spoil. So to prevent that from happening, Louis Pasteur developed this idea, this concept called pasteurization. So he demonstrated that these spoilage bacteria could be killed by heat um, that was not too hot to evaporate the alcohol or the wine, um, but still to kill the microorganism. So this idea or concept of pasteurization is where we apply high amounts of heat for a short amount of time. Um, and the treatments for it, either you have higher heat and a shorter amount of time or a little bit lower heat and slightly longer amount of time. They're kind of inversely related to one another. As your heat increases, the amount of time that the product has to be exposed is shorter, and, um, and as you reduce the level of heat that you're using, then you'll have to increase the exposure time. So also in that golden age, other notable people, um, Agnostio Vesti showed that the silkworm disease is caused by a fungus. Later on, Pasteur found that another silkworm disease was caused by a protozoan. Um, Ignace Simulai was an Italian physician. He was one of the first, and look at when this happened, in the 1840s, to actually advocate hand washing to prevent the transmission of childbirth, or what we call puerperal fever, from one obstetrical patient to another. During this time, or before this time, you were more likely to die of puerperal fever or childbirth fever um, if you were to give birth in a hospital than if you were to give birth at home. Um, some women who did not have the luxury of having a midwife or having someone skilled in their local community that would come and help them to deliver their babies would have to go to hospitals to deliver their child, and the medical students that would work in cadavers all day and that would um, um, be looking and dealing with other patients all day would come and deliver these babies without actually having adequately washed their hands. So he was the first to advocate using uh, the calcium or um, the lime of calcium chloride, so using a lime 
um, to spray it over his medical student's hands and over his hand, and that reduced the number of microbes that were on their hands tremendously, and it reduced the number of patients that would succumb to purpural fever um, astronomically. So his aseptic technique and his advocation of hand washing that we still very much abide by today in a medical or professional setting or even in a lab setting, um, he is attributed with that. Um, in the 1860s, applying pasture work, showing that microbes can be in the air, can spoil food. Another scientist, Joseph Lister, um, was able to develop a chemical disinfectant that was used to prevent surgical wound infections. So he would spray this disinfectant on um, surgical wounds and also on the, um, um, mostly on the, the, the surgical wounds where they were going to have these after they cut. Um, remember, in this time, you're very likely to die of surgery. If you had to have surgery, it's a good chance you weren't coming back, not because the surgery was unsuccessful, but because there was some secondary infection from microorganisms. Um, he developed a technique, a chemical compound, that we call Listerine. And we don't use Listerine for surgery anymore. We have other types of compounds that we use for that. Um, but we do use it as a mouthwash. So, and the chemical composition of the Listerine that we use as a mouthwash is very much similar to the Listerine that Joseph Lister used. And finally, we have Robert Koch who developed the cautious postulants after his work with anthrax um, and through these various experimental ex steps that he um, used to, with uh, formulating this idea to prove that specific microbes cause specific diseases. That's cautious postulate. In 1796, Edward Jenner um, inoculated persons with cowpox and found that those people could be protected from smallpox, and he called this process vaccination after the Latin word for vacca, cow, because he gave them cowpox. Legend has it that he noticed that the milkmaids would get um, cowpox on their hands from milking the cows all day, and one of the milkmaids told him that we don't get smallpox because we've already had cowpox. And so it's believed, and legend has it, that he used a, um, a child that volunteered, which probably was an orphan, and he just kind of said, hey, I'm going to do this to you, who had cowpox on the milkmaid and injected this milkmaid with um, smallpox to see if she actually developed smallpox. So he found out that she didn't and that she had this special protection that we call immunity. So with a lot of the vaccinations that we get, you're getting either a piece of or um, uh, an attenuated version of a virus or a bacteria that can make you sick, and it tells your body to make a memory cells against it so the next time that you see it in the wild, quote unquote, if you will, um, that your body is protected, you have immunity from it. This idea of vaccination, although Edward Jenner is credited with doing this, um, it is believed that in the Far East, in places like China, that there were their medicine men um, or their shamans were doing something very similar in taking smallpox and putting it on the head of a acupuncture needle and just slightly tapping it underneath the skin, and that was eliciting an immune response um, for many people in the Far East. So although Edward Jenner is credited with it, you have to keep in mind that um, we do have some record um, that this idea of vaccination was not developed in, solely by him, that in the Far East that they were doing this centuries before um, he discovered this. And from all of this, we come into the birth of modern chemotherapy. Chemotherapy just means treatment with chemicals. So if you're taking an antibiotic or you've ever been on an antibiotic regimen, you were a chemotherapeutic patient. Um, a lot of times we think of chemotherapy, we just think about um, uh, cancer patients. So chemotherapeutic agents are used to treat infections. They can be synthetic or they can be antibiotics. Um, antibiotics are chemicals that are produced by bacteria or even fungi because penicillin is actually a fungi that can inhibit or kill other microbes. Our understanding and the development of um, penicillin as an antibiotic was completely by accident. Andrew Fleming um, discovered the first antibiotic in 1928, um, and he found that penicillin fungus made, uh, made an antibiotic, um, and it killed Staph aureus. So by the 1940s, we thought we had the magic bullet um, one of the many times we thought we had a magic bullet, and um, that penicillin was tested 
um, clinically and mass produced. We now find that there are so many different, there are lots of different strains of bacteria that have evolved resistance to penicillin. So we have other derivatives like amoxicillin, we have methicillin, and even with some of our stronger antibiotics that are penicillin derived, they, um, some microbes we find have resistance to those as well. And here is a picture of um, some of Fleming's work or an example of what Fleming's work may have looked like. Here we have our normal bacteria colonies, and then where we have the penicillin colony, we don't see any bacteria growing around it. So it's been inhibited. It has this zone of what we call inhibition um, around the penicillin. And this is completely by accident. Kevin had sloppy lab work, and he allowed his plates, which should have been only growing staph aureus, um, he allowed his plates to be contaminated with penicillin. So modern developments in microbiology, we have bacteriology, the study of bacteria, micro, mycology, the study of fungi, virology, the study of viruses, and parasitology, the study of protozoan and parasitic worms. So as you can imagine, our course is only going to touch the surface of all of these different ologies or studies of. If you decide to go into a future of microbiology um, in academia or in your professional life, you're going to find that you'll have entire courses that are de dedicated to just fungi. And some courses that are only dedicated just to medically significant fungi, called medical mycology, or uh, medical virology, or medical par parasitology, or ecological parasitology. So microbiology is a huge umbrella that has many subdomains underneath it that also are large umbrellas for even further investigation in microbial life. So that's where we are going to stop for today. Um, on our next session, we will cover modern developments in microbiology. We'll continue to discuss that. We'll also discuss um, bioremediation and the normal microbia of the skin, biofilms, and we'll talk about some emerging infectious diseases to wrap up um, chapter one.